Hey guys, John here. How's it going? Today we're going to talk all about exception handling in Java. We're going to be going over what exceptions are, how you can handle them with what's called try catch blocks of code, what happens when you don't catch them right away, some different types of exceptions and what's called the exception hierarchy. And finally, we're going to learn about finally blocks and what they are and what they do and some super crazy unexpected results you can get if you don't understand what finally blocks do exactly. So you're definitely going to want to stick around and check that out. But first, what is an exception? An exception is a generally unwanted event that interrupts the normal flow of your program. But here's a quick example of some simple code that would cause an exception. We were trying to parse an int from the string pants. So you might be familiar with this integer parse int method. It just takes a string that you pass in that usually contains a number like one or you know, whatever, some kind of a number that's uh, parsable into an int. But here we're trying to parse the int pants. Let's go ahead and run it. We can see we get this number format exception because it can't make a number out of pants. Now, trust me, try as you might, you can't make a number from pants. It just has to blow up and throw an exception. I can't do what you want. If you, the programmer, don't handle the situation, your program blows up, prints some exception information to the console here that we're looking at, and terminates. That's it, game over. But now that is where exception handling comes in. So instead of just blowing up and terminating the program, you can catch the exception that's thrown and have special code to handle that situation elegantly instead of blowing up. In Java, we do that with try catch code blocks and they look like this. And first you have a try block and inside the curly brackets here, you write any code that you want that might cause an exception in some situations. And then underneath that, you have a catch block. You catch those types of exceptions and then write any code that you want to execute whenever that type of exception happens. Going back to our pants example from before, we can go ahead and paste in the code that causes the exception to be thrown in this try block here. So of course, same as before, this piece of code will throw a number format exception when we try to parse uh, pants into an integer. So we include this catch block that says we will catch a number format exception if it is thrown in the try block. Get it? Throw an exception, catch an exception. It honestly took me way too long into programming to make that connection. So in our example, when this number format exception is thrown, the code inside of our catch block will execute and the program won't have to terminate. Here so far, we don't have any code in our catch block. So let's go ahead and add some. Well, basic thing you might want to do is print out a message to the user. You might want it to say something like, um, Hey, dude, you can't make an int out of that. Stop trying to make it happen. All right, so now when our program tries to parse an int from pants, it'll throw an exception that our catch block will catch, and we'll see the statement print out. Let's go ahead and run that. And here we see the printout, but the program didn't terminate. We don't see the big angry stack trace of the exception that we saw last time. Also, it's important to note that if an exception is not thrown, this catch block will never be executed. So if we go ahead and change this to a normal int string of one, we can go ahead and run our program again. And we can see we got no output at all. The program just finished. We can add a little statement here at the end just to prove that the, the code is actually running. And here, run the program again. You can see that we finished the program, but we never executed this catch block because there was no exception thrown. There was no problem, so there was nothing that had to catch the exception and handle it. Now, it's important to note that the catch block here, this type of exception in your catch block, uses something called the exception hierarchy. And that just means that the type of exception that you put in your catch block will catch only exceptions of that type or any subclass of that exception. So as a quick example, you'll often see just catch exception E. And you can name this uh, exception variable that it catches anything you want. Often the convention is just to use like the initials of the type of exception that you're handling. That's why uh, number format exception was NFE. And for exception, you'll see exception E. So this means it will catch any type of exception at all. Any class of exception that extends from exception, and all of them do, this will catch all exceptions. And the way we had it before, number format exception will catch all types of number format exceptions. There could be subclasses of number format exceptions for specific types. This would catch all of those underneath that umbrella. And taking a quick look out at the documentation for a number format exception, we can see the, the, we can see the hierarchy 
that uh, it comes from. So of course, object is the parent of every single class in Java. And then underneath that, we have throwables. And then right underneath that, exception. And every type of exception in Java is going to be underneath that. And a few steps down, we find the number format exception. One of my favorite terms in programming comes from this, uh, when you're catching every type of exception here. Uh, I've heard it called a Pokemon exception handling, because got to catch them all. Now, you may have noticed from this uh, class hierarchy here, that there's also these throwables. So it's important to note that there are actually two types of throwables. There are exceptions that we're going to talk about here, and also errors. Generally, you don't want to be catching errors. So you might see some programmers uh, saying catch throwable T here instead of exception E. And uh, that's generally not recommended. You don't want to be catching just th all throwables because you don't want to catch errors. You just want to catch exceptions. Uh, it's, it's enough to say it could just cause some really strange, unexpected behaviors. Now, in your programs, you don't necessarily need to catch your exception right at the exact line that it happens. When an exception gets thrown and it's not caught immediately in the method that it's in right then, it'll get thrown up to the method that called it. That's called the call stack. Thrown exception goes up the call stack until it is caught by a catch statement like this. So for example, if we had all of this code and it was in a method uh, just called like get int or something. But right now we have our try catch in that method, but we don't have to. Often it makes sense to have your try catch in the method that calls the method that's throwing the exception. We could refactor it to look like this. So what happens here is when this line throws a number format exception and it's not caught immediately in this method, it gets thrown up the call stack. That just means it's thrown to the method that called this method. And in here, it's thrown back up to this level in the main method. And here we have a try catch. So it's going to get thrown out to this level of the call stack and caught by this exception handling code here. So let's go ahead and run it. Yeah, our exception handling still worked. We still got the hey dude comment and the code ended with no explosions of an exception. Uh, no stack trace printed out to the console. Another cool thing to note is you can catch multiple types of exceptions with multiple catch blocks. So you might have your first catch before like a number format exception, and then you could have another block, just copy that and paste it to catch a, like say maybe a null pointer exception. This allows us to have different behavior depending on the type of exception that was thrown. Say you want to catch different types of exceptions, you just want one bit of code to be able to handle multiple different types of exceptions. Well, you're in luck. Ever since uh, Java 7, you can have what's called a multi-catch statement. And to code one of those, we can just get rid of our second catch statement, and just have number format exception, and then to denote the multiple types of exceptions you want to catch here in this block, you use a bar character, the same character you would use for or statements, number format exception, or null pointer exception, and run the same exception handling code in either case. And that way you avoid code duplication while still being able to catch multiple types of exceptions. Pretty cool. Finally, let's talk about finally blocks. So if you want, you can include a finally block after your catch block that'll look like this. Uh, look very similar, just finally this. All this block does is to contain code that you want to execute whether there was an exception or not. It will always execute. Always, always, always. So just as an example, let's go ahead and put, um, let's see, in the finally block right here. So we can see when the finally block is executed. Just to make things simple, we're going to get rid of our extra method here and just put this statement that causes the exception directly in this try block. Now what'll happen is this pants parsing uh, will again throw an exception, a number format exception. So we'll just get rid of this null pointer exception catching. So this will catch the number format exception, print out the message to the user, and then it will run the finally block. Again, the finally block runs whether there was an exception here or not. Let's go ahead and run our program. And so you can see we caught the exception, printed out the hey dude, and then printed out in the finally block. And real quick, an important thing to note, when an exception is thrown, the rest of the code after that in the try will not be executed. So for example, we could have a print statement here that says, after parsing pants. Now if we run our program, 
You'll notice you, it, it never reaches that piece of code. It doesn't get here because an exception was thrown here and out to this catch statement. So anyway, getting back to our finally, uh, after it ran what was in the try, uh, which threw an exception, ran what was in the catch, it finally ran what was in finally. And it will execute that whether there's an exception or not. So we can change this back to a one, so an exception will not be thrown, run our program, and now we see this, this catch block was not executed. But we have, after parsing pants, this didn't throw an exception, so it could print this statement. And then the catch code never executed because there was never an exception thrown, uh, but it still executed the finally code, no matter what. Now, when I say no matter what, I mean no matter what. You can literally have a return statement here in your try. You would think that after this code executes and you get to return, it would just return out of this method and not execute anything else, but it will always execute your finally block. See? Even though you have a return statement here after parsing pants, it still runs your finally. And here's an even weirder example of the same thing. What we have is a simple private method that just returns an int called print a number. And, and all we've got here is a try catch finally statement, where in the try statement, we say return three. In the catch statement, we say return four. And in the finally statement, we say return five. But of course, what's in this try block won't cause any exceptions, so the catch block should never get called. But in the try block, we're saying return three. And in the finally block, we're saying return five. In our main method, all we're doing is printing out the result of this method call. So, so let me know, what do you think the result of this method should be? The answer is five. And remember, what I was saying is the finally code always executes. A ret and, that, and that means that a return statement in your finally will override a return statement in your try or your catch blocks. And that could lead to some super unexpected situations. So there's something to keep in mind. Most of the time you are not going to need a return statement in your finally block. Generally, just avoid it. And it's also a good Java interview question to know about. You could be asked about this. Know the type of behavior that finally has. After seeing this, you might be thinking, goodness, why would, what would I ever need a finally for? Uh, most of the time you don't. Most of the time a try catch block is all you need. You have some code you want to try that might throw an exception and the catch block handles that exception. That's all you have to do. But uh, there are certain special situations where you might want to finally block. Maybe in your try, you're doing like a database call or some file input output in your try statement. Uh, and you always want to close your connection like to the database or to the file stream. Because that's something you would always want to do um, if there's some database issue or a file issue, you always want to close that connection. And that's the kind of thing you would put in your finally block. 99 times out of 100, you're probably just going to have a try catch statement. If you got some value from this video, please let me know with a like. It is amazingly appreciated. And hit the subscribe button if you'd like to see more Java tutorials as they come out. See you guys next time.